We start the seventh lecture, Isaac Luria and a school from Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism by Gershom G. Killen. One. After the exodus from Spain, Catholicism underwent a complete transformation, a catastrophe of this dimension which uprooted one of the main branches of the Jewish people, could hardly take place without affecting every sphere of Jewish life and feeling, and the great material and spiritual upheaval of that crisis. Kabbalism established its claim to spiritual domination in Judaism. This fact became immediately obvious in its transformation from an esoteric into a popular doctrine. When Jews were expelled from Spain, in 1492 of the Common Era. Wait, isn't that Columbus sailed the ocean blue too? The Kabbalistic form of Jewish mysticism had reached the end of a certain stage of development. The main currents of 12th and 13th century Kabbalism had run their course by the close of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th. This concluded with the beginning of the persecution of the Jews in Spain and the appearance of Morano Judaism after 1391 in the literature of the 15th century reflects an unmistakable felicity of religious thought and expression. The Kabbalists of the time were a small group of esoterics who had little desire to spread their ideas and who would have been the last to remote any movement for introducing radical changes into Jewish life or for altering its rhythms. Only two isolated mystics the authors of the Raya Mahemna and of the book Palaya had been dreaming about a mystical revolution in Jewish life, and nothing had responded to their call. Babylonism was essentially the privilege of the elect who pursued the path of ever deeper penetration into the mysteries of God. This attitude was clearly manifest in the older Kabbalah with its neutralization of all messianic tendencies, which, though not complete, was very marked. This comparative indifference to the suggestion that the course of history might be somewhat shortened by mystical means was due to the fact that originally the mystics and apocalyptics had turned their thoughts in the reverse direction. The Kabbalists concentrated all their mental and emotional powers not upon the messianic end of the world, but upon the closing stage of the unfolding universe, but rather upon its beginning, or put it, in other words, in their speculation. They were on the whole more concerned with creation than with redemption. Redemption was to be achieved not by storming onward in an attempt to hasten historic crises and catastrophes, but rather by retracing the path that leads to the primordial beginnings of creation and revelation. At the point where the world processed the history of the universe and of God began to evolve within a system of laws, he who knew the way by which he had come might hope eventually to retrace his steps. The mystical meditations of the Kabbalist on theogony and cosmogony thus produced a non-messianic and individualistic mode of redemption or salvation. In union, says a 14th century Kabbalist, there is redemption. In these meditations, history was purged of its taint, since the Kabbalist sought to find their way back to their original unity, to the world structure prior to Satan's first deception. With the consequences of which they were bound to this point. The Kabbalah might have absorbed the intensity of messianism and became a more powerful apocalyptic factor because retracing the spiritual process to the ultimate foundations of existence might in itself have been regarded as the redemption. In the sense that the world would thus return to the unity and purity of its beginnings. This returned to the cosmogonic starting point as the central aim of the Kabbalah need not always have proceeded in the silent and aloof meditations of the individual, which have and can have no relation to the outward events. After the catastrophe of the Spanish expulsion, which so radically altered the outer aspect of the Kabbalah, if not its innermost content, it is also it also became possible to consider the return to the starting point of creation as the means of precipitating the final world catastrophe, which would come to pass when the return had been achieved by many individuals united in desire for the end of the world.
and well, it's not just to end the world, right? Um, but certainly, if we want a messianic age, we're certainly going to have to, you know, be the sort of decent people that can, you know, be properly led by such an anointed one, right? A great emotional upheaval having taken place, the individual mystic's absorption could have been transformed by a kind of mystical dialects into the religious aspiration of the whole community. In that event, what had been hidden under the mild aspect of Tikkun, striving for the perfection of the world, you know, jihad, if you're going to, jihad and peace of if you're going to throw in the Arabic phrase, um, and yes, Jews would agree that Allah is God, um, would be revealed as a potent weapon, one capable of destroying all the forces of evil, and such destruction would in itself have been tantamount to redemption. Though messianic calculations, ideas, and visions were not an essential part of the older Kabbalah, it was by no means lacking in these matters, and it should not be inferred that Kabbalism altogether disregarded the problem of redemption in our time. The point is that if and when it did concern itself with it, it did so in a spirit of super arrogation, typical of the catastrophic aspects of redemption of which the Kabbalists were fully aware is the gruesome fact that long before 1492 some Kabbalistic writers had proclaimed that catastrophic year as the year of redemption. However, 1492 brought no liberation from above but a most cruel exile here below. The consciousness that redemption signified both liberation and catastrophe permeated the new religious movement to such an extent that it can only be called the averse side of the apocalyptic temper predominating in Jewish life. Now, apocalypse is really an unveiling. It's not necessarily the end times, um, although, you know, such things can be reflected and such. The concrete effects and consequences of the catastrophe of 1492 were by no means confined to the Jews then living. As a matter of fact, the historic process set going by the expulsion from Spain required several generations, almost an entire century, to work itself out completely. Only by degrees did its tremendous implications permeate even more profound regions of being. This process helped to merge the apocalyptic and messianic elements of Judaism with the traditional aspects of Kabbalism. The last age became as important as the first, instead of reverting to the dawn of history, or rather to its metaphysical antecedents, the new doctrines laid the emphasis on the final stages of the cosmological process. The pathos of messianism pervaded the new Kabbalah and its classical forms of expression as it never did the Zohar. The beginning and the end were linked together. The contemporaries of expulsion were aware chiefly of the concrete problems it had created, but not of its deep-lying implications, religious thought, and its theological expression. For the exiles from Spain, the catastrophical character of the end was again made clear. To sum up and relate and release all the forces capable of hastening the end became once more the chief aim of the mystics. The messianic doctrine previously, the concern of those interested in apologetics, was made for a time the subject of an aggressive propaganda. The classic compendia in which Isaac Abarbanel codified the messianic doctrines of Judaism a few years after the expulsion were soon followed by numerous epistles, tracts, homilies, and apocalyptic writings, in which repercussions of the catastrophe reach their most vigorous expression. In these writings, whose authors were at great pains to link up the expulsion with the ancient prophecies, the redemptive character of the 1492 catastrophe was strongly emphasized. The birth pangs of the messianic era, with which history is to end, are as the apocalyptics would have it to collapse, were therefore assumed to have set in with the expulsion. The sharply etched and impressive figure of Abraham 
Ben Eliezer Halabi in Jerusalem, an untiring agitator and interpreter of events pregnant with redemption. It is typical of a generation of Kabbalists in which the apocalyptic abyss yawned, but without swallowing up the traditional categories of the mystical theology are, has happened later, transforming it. The emotional force and eloquence of a preacher of repentance were here combined with the passion for the apocalyptic interpretation of history and of historical theology, but the very belief that redemption was near prevented the drastic experiences of the expulsion, vividly as they were still remembered, from being transmuted into ultimate religious concepts, only gradually as the expulsion ceased to be regarded in a redemptive light and loomed up all the more distinctly in its catastrophic character, did the flames which had flared up from the apocalyptical abyss sweep over wide areas of the Jewish world until they finally seized upon and recast the mystical theology of Kabbalism. The new Kabbalah, which was fashioned from this transforming and fusing process in the community of the devout at Safed, or enduring marks of the event to which it owed its origin. For once, the catastrophic had been sown as a fertile seed in the heart of this new Kabbalah. Its teachings were bound to lead to that further catastrophe which became acute with the Sabbatean movement, the mood which prevailed in Kabbalistic circles and kindled by the apocalyptic propaganda in the groups influenced by them, reflected most revealingly in two anonymous works. Sefer Hameshev, the Book of Revelations, and Kav Hakatora. Hakatora? I'm not sure how these are spelled, some of them, so I don't necessarily know how to pronounce it. Um, the Censor, written about 1500 of the Common Era, and it's preserved in manuscript. The first is a commentary on the Torah, and the second commentary on the Psalms. Both authors tried to force apocalyptic meanings into every word of the scriptures. The scriptures were alleged to have 70 faces, and a manifest a different face to each generation with a different mode of address. In their own generation, every word of the Bible was assumed to refer to exile and redemption. The entire scriptures were interpreted as a series of symbols of the preliminary events, sorrows, and travail of the redemption, which these authors most vividly envisaged as a catastrophe. The author of Kaf Hakatora, in particular, took up a very radical position, employing every device of that mystical precision with which the Kabbalists read the Bible. He infused extraordinary apocalyptical meanings into the words of the Psalms and held up the Psalter as a textbook of the millennium and the messianic catastrophe. He furthermore developed an exceedingly bold theory of the Psalms as apocalyptic hymns and of the comfort which these hymns yield to worshipers. The secret function of true hymns was to serve as magical weapons to be wielded in the final struggle, weapons which were endowed with unlimited powers of purification and destruction so that they might annihilate all the forces of evil. Well, perhaps that's a little bit overstating it, but they are formulas. Um, the power, you could say, lies in God. And we say that, um, you know, it comes in and we're, we're vehicles for that or we're means for that. Um, but the means, whether it's us or even the scriptures and religious acts itself, you know, um, you know, to take that monotheism thing a little bit further towards, you know, because um, that sounds like, like worshiping the book, right? Uh, seen in this light, the words of the Psalms stood forth as sharp swords in Israel's hand, Israel meaning the upright of God, and deadly weapons. The Psalter itself was envisaged in the double capacity of a book of war songs and of an arsenal of weapons for the last war. Before the final apocalyptic struggle in which these weapons were meant to be used, the tremendous apocalyptic power latent in the words of the Psalms is to manifest itself in the form of comfort, which is really the glow and secret crackling of the apocalyptic fires in their depths. Comfort is the classical symbol of delay, 
even the delay of the final consummation, undesirable as it is, has a healing force. Comfort paves the way for the apocalyptic struggle, but when once the absolute power of the divine words erupts from beneath the comforting guise of meditation and promise, all the forces will be transformed as the author puts it in the language of apocalyptic dialects. Such deep-seated feeling as to the religious significance of catastrophes was bound after the acute apocalyptic phase had subsided to be transferred to more solid and substantial regions and there to struggle for expression. This expression was achieved in the far-reaching changes in the outlook on life and in the new religious conceptions with which the Kabbalah of Safed laid claim to dominate the Jewish world, and did in fact so dominate it for a long time. Exiles from Spain must have held an intense belief in the fiendish realities of exile, a belief that was bound to destroy the illusion that it was possible to live peacefully under the holy law in exile. It expressed itself in a vigorous insistence upon the fragmentary character of Jewish existence and in mystical views and dogmas to explain the fragmentariness with its paradoxes and tensions. Now, when you're not in a religious state, I would definitely say that as long as you're not being oppressed, just because others around you aren't making the behavioral or confession of belief sort of choices that you are, doesn't mean you can't live in peace. And you can certainly get along with them as far as they are doing what's good and true, and you can encourage that. These views won widespread acceptance as the social and spiritual effects of the movement, which originated either in the catastrophe of 1492 itself or in the Kabbalistic apocalyptic propaganda attached to that event, made themselves increasingly felt life was conceived as existence in exile and in self-contradiction, and the sufferings of exile were linked up with the central Kabbalistic doctrines about God and man. The emotions aroused by these sufferings were not soothed and tranquilized, but stimulated and whipped up. The ambiguities and inconsistencies of unredeemed existence, which were reflected in the meditations on the Torah and the nature of prayer, led that generation to set up ultimate values, which differed widely from those of the rationalist theology of the Middle Ages, if only because the religious ideals it affirmed had no connection with the scale of values based on an intellectual point of view. Aristotle had represented the essence of rationalism to Jewish minds, yet his voice, which had not lost its resonance even in medieval capitalism, despite its passage through a variety of media, now began to sound hollow and spectral to ears attuned to the new Kabbalah. The books of the Jewish philosophers became devilish books. Death, repentance, and rebirth were the three great events in human life by which the new Kabbalah sought to bring man into blissful union with God. Humanity was threatened not only by its own corruption, but by that of the world, which originated in the first breach in creation, when subject and object first parted a company. By its emphasis upon death and rebirth, rebirth either in the sense of reincarnation or by the spiritual process of repentance, the Kabbalistic propaganda through which the new messianism sought to win its way gained in directness and popularity. The propaganda shaped the new attitudes and social customs which originated in Safed no less than the new systems and theologumena on which they were based. There was a passionate desire to break down the exile by enhancing its torments, savoring its bitterness to the utmost even to the night of the exile of the Shekinah itself, and the summoning up of the compelling force of the repentance of a whole community, the Zohar promised redemption if only a single Jewish community would repent wholeheartedly. The strength of the belief in this promise was demonstrated in Safed, even while the attempt itself failed. Attempts to curtail or end exile by organized mystical action not rarely took on a social or even quasi-political character. All these tendencies, which were manifested in the very theater of the redemption, Eretz Israel, clearly reflected the circumstances in which the Kabbalah became the authentic voice of the people in the crisis produced by the banishment from Spain. The horrors of exile were mirrored in the Kabbalistic doctrine of metempsychosis, which now won immense popularity by stressing 
the various stages, or the soul's exile, the most terrible fate that could befall any soul, far more ghastly than the torments of hell, was to be outcast or naked, a state producing either rebirth or even admission to hell. Such absolute exile was the worst nightmare of a soul which envisaged its personal drama in terms of the tragic destiny of the whole people. Absolute homelessness was the sinister symbol of absolute godlessness, of utter moral and spiritual degradation. Union with God or utter banishment were the two poles between which a, a system had to be devised in which the Jews could live under the domination of law, which seeks to destroy the forces of exile. This new Kabbalism stands and falls with its program of bringing its doctrines home to the community and preparing it for the coming of the Messiah. On the lofty pinnacles of speculative thought, sustained by the deep fonts of mystical contemplation, it never proclaimed a philosophy of escape from the maddening crowd. It did not content itself with this aristocratic seclusion of a few elect, but made popular education its business. In this, it was for a long time surprisingly successful, a comparison of typical popular moralizing and edifying treatises and writings before and after 1550 of the vulgar era reveals the fact that until and during the first half of the 16th century, this type of popular literature showed no trace of Kabbalistic influence. After 1550, the majority of these writers propagated Kabbalistic doctrines. In the centuries that followed, almost all the outstanding treatises on morals were written by mystics, and with the exception of Moses Hayim Rizato in his Path of the Upright, Mesalath, Yeshurim, their authors made no attempt to conceal this fact. Moses Cordovo's Tomer Deborah, Elijah de Vidas Rashit, Chokma Eliezer, Ezekri's Sefer Haradim, Hayim Vital's Share Kadusha, Isaiah Horovitz, Shne Uchat, Habaret, Zeba, Kordenabers, Kav Ha Yashar, to mention only a few of a long list of similar writings between 1550 and 1750. All played their part in carrying the religious message of the Kabbalah into every Jewish home. Uh, part two. The most important period in the history of the older uh, of the older Kabbalah is linked up with the little Spanish town of Gorona and Catalonia, where a whole group of mystics were active in the first half of the 13th century. This circle was also the first which succeeded in familiarizing influential circles of Spanish Jewry with Kabbalist thought. It was mainly their spiritual heritage that was brought to the fore in the Zohar. Similarly, the town of Safed in Upper Galilee became about 40 years after the exodus from Spain the center of the new Kabbalistic movement. There, its particular doctrines were first formulated, and from there they began their victorious march through the Jewish world. Strange as it may seem, the religious ideas of the mystics of Safed, which had such an immense influence, have, to this day, not been properly explored. The fact is that all the scholars who followed Gratz and Geiger were inclined to single out the Lernianic school of, of Kabbalism for attack and to pillory it. Hence, anyone can read in our historical literature how deeply Isaac Luria injured Judaism. But it is not so easy to discover what, Is uh, what Luria actually thought. The mystical system, the influence of which on Jewish history has certainly been no less considerable than that of Maimonides, guide of the perplexed, was considered by 19th century rationalism a slightly unsavory subject. This view no longer holds good. There is a valuable introduction to the subject in Schechter's beautiful essay. Safed in the 16th century, where he describes the general characteristics of the movement, and more particularly some of the leading figures, but Schechter, who says, I lay no claim on uh, to being initiated in the science of the invisible, studiously refrains from giving what would amount to an analysis of their mystical ideas. It is here that our task really begins. Now, nowadays, people would criticize Isaac Luria's school 
in terms of it's not really uh, supportive of the whole uh, Zionism thing, is it? Um, that it takes, and back then they would criticize it because a person could be more direct in using these things and the reliance on one's righteousness per se rather than the uh, continual authorities and you know established interpretations so but does that really injure Judaism when there was never one Judaism to begin with I mean as far as we know because as soon as something that you could call Judaism appeared about 540 some say it's not that early but I, I I've personally traced it back to 540 um, the dates show up to that. Some say, you know, 30 years later. Some say the historic mention of Judaism by name with the second book of Maccabees around then is when it started. Whatever you say. Um, there was never one Judaism. The Papalists of Sapid have left numerous and sometimes voluminous writings some of them complete systems of mystical thought, of which the two most famous are those of Moses ben Jacob Cordovero and of Isaac Luria. It would be a fascinating text to compare and contrast the personalities and ideas of the two men and the manner which Plutarch developed in his famous biographies, for they differ as much from one another as they are intimately related to each other. I must leave such an analysis for another occasion. Let me, however, say this much. Cordovero is essentially a systematic thinker. His purpose is to give both a new interpretation and a systematic description of the mystical heritage of the older Kabbalah, particularly the Zohar. One may say that this thinking, rather than a new stage of mystical thought, leads him to new ideas and formulas. To describe him in the terms of Evelyn Underhill, he is a mystical philosopher rather than a mystic, although he was by no means lacking mystical experience altogether. Of the Theoreticians of Jewish mysticism, Cordovo is undoubtedly the greatest. He was the first to make an attempt to describe the dialectical process through which the Sephiroth pass in the course of their development, with particular emphasis on that side of the process which may be said to take place inside each. Again, it was he who tried to interpret the various stages of emanation as stages of the divine mind. The problem of the relation of the substance of Ain Sof to the organism and instruments, Kalem, i.e. vessels or bowls, through which it works and acts, was one to which he returned again and again. The intrinsic conflict between the theistic and pantheistic tendencies in the mystical theology of Kabbalism is nowhere brought out more clearly than in his thought, and his attempts to s synthesize the contradiction not only dominated the speculative side of his thinking, but also produced tentative solutions which are frequently as profound and audacious as they are problematical. His ideas on the subject are summed up in the formula a century before Spinoza and Malebranc that God is all reality, but not all reality is God. Ein Suf, according to him, well, Ein Sof is how it's spelled in this book, um, can also be thought, i.e., thought of the world, insofar as everything that exists is contained in the substance, he encompasses all existence, but not in the mode of its isolated existence below, but rather in the existence of the substance, for he and existing things are in this mode one, and neither separate nor multifarious, nor externally visible, but rather his substance is present in his sephiroth, and he himself is everything and nothing exists outside of him. Cordovo's fecundity as a writer is comparable to that of Bonaventura or Thomas Aquinas, and like the latter, he died comparatively young. When death carried him away in 1570, he was only 48 years old. The bulk of his writings is still extant, including an immense commentary on the Zohar, which has come down to us in a complete copy from the original. He had the gift of transforming everything into literature, and in this, as, in many other things, he was the complete antithesis of Isaac Luria, in whom we meet, the outstanding representative of later Kabbalism. Luria was not only a true Sadiq, Optic, 
or saintly man, that Cordovero uh, Cordovero was no less from all we know about him. But in addition, there was also in him that creative power which has led to every successive generation to regard him as the leader of the Sapid movement. He was also the first Kabbalist whose personality impressed his disciple so deeply that some thirty odd years after his death, a kind of saint's biography began to circulate which relates not only a multitude of legends, but a faithful description of many of his personal traits. It is contained in three letters written by one Solomon, better known as Shlomel Dresnitz, who came from Strasnitz in Moravia, the Safed, in the year 1602 of the Common Era, and from there spread Luria's fame in his letters to his Kabbalistic friends in Europe. Luria was no less a scholar.